You're listening to the Autism Weekly Podcast. Each week we share community voices and bring light to stories that increase awareness, acceptance, equity, access, and inclusion. If you haven't already, subscribe to join the Autism Weekly family. I'm your host, Jeff Skabitsky. This week, we're joined by the dynamic duo, Kim Hughes and Amy Roberts, who are ASHA certified speech language pathologists. Kim brings 23 years of experience specializing in children with language disorders, ADHD, ASD, and dyslexia. Amy, with nearly two decades in the field, focuses on articulation disorders and loves weaving yoga concepts into her sessions. They are all about incorporating movement play, yoga, and sensory activities into therapy, achieving remarkable results. Additionally, they have both received their 200-hour training certification to be able to practice yoga with the speech pathology background. In today's episode, we'll discuss the benefits of using yoga to improve communication skills in children with autism. Kim and Amy, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. One of the things I love to be able to do, because I I think we all get into this field because we have a passion, we have that service orientation, and our interests are really what guided us to kind of build our professions. But I'd love to hear the background story from each of you to be able to understand, you know, where this came from, where these ideas kind of merged together. And maybe we'll start with uh, with you, Amy, and then and then hear from Kim as well. But what brought you into the field of both speech pathology and yoga? Well, yeah, thank you for asking. Kim and I could talk forever about this because both are such passions of ours. So um, as a younger person, I was very interested in the healthcare population, but knew that maybe nursing or being a doctor was not quite what I wanted to do. Um, and really learned about speech pathology because my grandmother had a stroke while she was living with us and had home health therapists come in and work with her. So I got to sit and watch her do her occupational therapy and her speech therapy work. And I just thought, that's for me. That's something that I want to do. And I started out really wanting to work in the population of stroke patients and TBI patients. Um, And as I went through my, you know, graduate school time, I found yoga as a way to help me calm my very anxious graduate student nerves and keep me focused and centered. And I started that practice as a graduate student and just continued it as I, you know, started my career and met different challenges in family life and life in general. Yoga was something that kept me very grounded and also helped me stay healthy and you know, physically active. So when I started working as a speech pathologist, and this is where our our stories kind of merge, Kim was my clinical supervisor. So in our field, you have nine months where you are supervised by someone. And I was so lucky to have Kim as my supervisor. And we found that we both shared this love of yoga And I'll turn it over to Kim. She can kind of like tell you her background and then pick it up from there as to how we decided to merge our speech and language love and yoga together. (laughs) I appreciate you sharing all that. And and Kim, uh, maybe you can expand a little bit about, you know, prior to starting that work with Amy and then also as kind of where you all have gone since that journey started of being able to take yoga principles into speech and language pathology. Sure. So I had a brother, a younger brother who had speech delays, and I used to go watch his speech sessions at the University of Maryland where he received therapy. And I didn't know it at the time, but I think I was soaking it up and I would be his teacher at home. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, I went and got a degree in journalism, which is communication. And then I was in an adopt-to-school program where we were working with kids in D.C. who needed support with reading, and I really fell in love with reading intervention. And I knew I wanted to go back to school, and I decided on speech-language pathology. And when I got there, I kind of realized, oh, wait, this is what I should have been doing all along, but really marrying my love of communication and reading. So 
at, but at the same time, I had been doing a lot of yoga for many, many years, and it was a, a heartfelt passion. So um, I kind of credit my brother and his his you know challenges, and um, I just told him that recently. He said, "Oh, I didn't know that." I said, yes, yes, you're the reason I do the work I do now, and that so that was like really poignant moment for our family. But anyway, so uh, meanwhile, back at the ranch, we were at um, Kingsbury Day School. Amy and I were working together. And we just both saw an opportunity to integrate movement into our work because we worked with occupational therapists and physical therapists. And sometimes we would sort of steal their ideas and use them in our own therapy or co-treat with them. So we learned a lot about sort of, you know, the miracles of adding movement. And we didn't really, again, know at the time what was happening, but we were seeing what sensory integration could do for the body and the mind. And then we put together a class, an after-school class called something like the language of yoga. And we really focused on listening, um, following directions and moving and integrating the um, expressive language pieces of how we thought you could talk while doing yoga. What? That's not allowed. You're supposed to be quiet. And Speech language pathologists are definitely talkers, so it only made sense to us to put talking with yoga together, and that's what we do. Mm-hmm. So interesting. Each of these times, as, as every time I get to talk to somebody, is that I feel like the inspiration comes from different places, but it's always personal. Like there's always that touch to it that it's like, you know, it's somebody made me start thinking through this process, or I went through this journey with somebody else. And together we got to, the, to a decision of where to be able to take things. Um, I'd love to get into the idea of how yoga supports speech. And I guess I, I'll go back to kind of 25 years ago when I started in the field is that the one of the biggest things that kind of was being pushed out there, and, and I agree with to this day, is that with language, sign oftentimes helps with verbal recall. It helps you to kind of prompt yourself to be able to make those languages. And it sounds to me like yoga and movement is an expansion on that and a logical one where whole body movement might even do more. But can you give me some examples of potentially where this connection between yoga and communication comes in, whether it's the articulation piece or the ability to be spontaneous. I'd love to hear both angles. Um, Kim, maybe we could start with you with the articulation um, and kind of go, or sorry, that's Amy's specialty, I think. Uh, I'll start with Amy Amy on that. No, she really came up with the most amazing idea (laughs) on the planet. I'll let you tell (laughs) me. Well, thanks, Kim. That's Kim is so, she's so, I'm a big fan of babies. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you mentioned that uh, Kim and I received our 200 hour training in yoga. And while I was doing that, we had bounced around this idea of how can we combine our speech and language therapy with yoga? Because we both had experienced that after a yoga class, you feel different, right? If you've taken yoga before, your nervous system is calmed down. That is one of the one of the benefits of yoga that research is showing more and more that the state your body and your mind and your nervous system is in following a, a yoga practice is just this calm state. And we know that in order to learn, you need to be in a calm state. And a lot of times the children that we are working with don't live in that state. It's a place they're unfamiliar with sometimes because they've got their busy minds or their sensory system isn't fully integrated. And yoga provides the, I have to use the word perfect because that's how I feel about it, the perfect opportunity to integrate the sensory system. So after I completed my 200 hour, I was just trying to figure out how can I use yoga to address articulation? How can I teach a child where to put their tongue, how to hold their jaw, what kind of strength they need in their mouth to make a specific sound? And I just had this moment of, I can do it with yoga poses because you feel the whole pose in your entire body. So I literally sat in my basement with my three kids and we went through all the sounds in the English language, including all the vowels. And we felt 
our movements and we moved in different ways and saw what happened when we went upside down. What did gravity do to our tongue inside our mouth? And if I need to lift my tongue up, can I lift a part of my body to help send that message? Something needs to lift. Can I be feeling really strong in my whole body if my tongue has to feel really strong? So that was the first connection that we made in terms of the articulation piece. Because we know that the, the process of making speech sounds is the most fine motor process that we have as humans. And you can't produce, you can't um, engage in these fine motor tasks if you can't do it at the gross motor level. So addressing mm-hmm. the gross motor first gets you to that fine motor piece. So that's the articulation piece of talk yoga that Kim and I have seen therapists have more fun with articulation therapy, which is so exciting because there's a lot of us that are like, ugh, articulation, I don't want to do that. But this, <laughs> and that's Kim. <laughs> I used to be me until I started doing Arctic the way we do Arctic. And it's so much more fun for everyone because if we're having fun, then our clients are having fun and they're more likely to engage and co-regulate with us. Right. Successful, which is so awesome. So, yeah. yeah. And just when I had the chance to watch some of the videos that you all have on your website, and uh, I think it's great that you have them there. It, it gives you kind of, as a clinician, you can kind of step back and be like, oh, that's what it looks like. Yeah. And it, it dawned on me when you were talking through some of the poses and kind of how the body's positioned and how that creates an easier way to create the sounds. Um, it just sounded so logical to me that, you know, that's where you'd have to start. You have to start with success. You have to start with the ability to make some things easier and then shape it over time to where it becomes more natural. But I want to go into it. And can, maybe you can give me a little bit of description because oftentimes when people hear calm and children with ADHD, children with uh, who identify autistic, you're thinking, well, I'm going to have them sit in a room in a chair and they have to be quiet. They have to have quiet hands. They have to have quiet feet, which <laughs> I, I obviously is not the right way to be doing it. But that's historically what was there. Yeah. What does it what does calm mean? Is it is it more like in like trying to figure out that inner sort of space of, you know, I, I'm in a learning environment i'm in a space where i can attach to things around me what is that what's that calm feeling mean when you're talking about it with yoga yeah i'm a, that's really deep question because i think calm is different for everyone it is and it isn't right so i think with somebody who's first learning how to be calm that's different than somebody who's well practiced at it so i i you know giving our students the opportunity to just be with a calm person who's not reacting and getting upset with them. So that's why we, you know, really advocate the practice of yoga among people who think like us, because if we can come into our sessions feeling regulated and calm, then the child, the other person can respond in in turn or feel safer. And that's really one of the important things about, you know, the vagus nerve. We, We talk a lot about that in talk yoga. The vagus nerve helps us regulate our states of arousal, and then also our states of calm. And if we can help our students learn how to just watch us, they can just first watch us and just see what we do. They don't even have to engage initially. They can just, and they're like, oh, they're on the floor with me. Hmm, that's interesting. Okay, I'm down with that. That's kind of cool. No one's ever gotten on the floor with me before. Well, let's see what's the next step. And then if we, you know, practice some breathing or a yoga movement, they might join in or they might not, but they see that we're, we're trying to connect and giving them the opportunity in the time and space to really absorb it and, and think about whether or not they want to participate and how they might participate. Mm-hmm. No. And I mean, I think what you're touching on is something that I'm, I'm seeing blend across other disciplines, which is kind of that idea of a scent based care is that the child wants to be a part of the treatment, they're excited by it, and then that's when they're going to be able to really start achieving some of their goals because it's fun, it's engaging, it's it's something that they see value in. And when I watched your videos, I think it was the flow sessions, which will be my follow-up question, but um, <laughs> which will, uh, what I was watching is that each child 
seemed like they were at a different space in the journey. People weren't correcting them and forcing them to do different things. It was kind of helping them just to attach a little bit to the feeling of what was happening and that they were doing it on a relatively a self-paced process. But um, maybe, uh, Amy, you can give me a little bit of understanding on, on the those flow sessions. It's It didn't seem correct to, to me. It seemed very engaging. How does a child kind of progress through that so that they... I saw everybody doing it by the end. So obviously people are attaching. How does that work throughout your session? Yeah, so that's actually something that we love to observe in our students that we work with because there are those children who initially come to a talk yoga session and they don't really know what to expect. And so we have our kids that just observe and they will just sit there and kind of, well, this is different, like Kim was saying. She's on the ground. They are all on the ground. They're, you know, we're moving and we're talking. And we so we have a range of children who observe, children who are trying, children who are maybe like nervous about this new experience. And so like you like you saw and observed in our videos, it's not this corrective, oh, you have to have the perfect looking downward facing dog, you know, or you got to do the flow exactly right or say the words exactly right. No. In fact, that is something that we, when we do our trainings with professionals, we really talk about that a lot, that this is an opportunity to provide ownership, that the child takes ownership in this experience, and that it is not us telling them what they're doing wrong, because they're used to hearing that pretty regularly. And so we love to encourage and to create an environment where not anything goes, but we have this fun flow, this fun pose, and we're going to show you, we're going to model so you know what to expect and you try your very best. And, and there is a feeling of that. I think in the yoga classes I like to go to anyway, there's this non-competitive feeling that it's you, it's your practice, it's your experience. And so we really try to emulate that and to express that to our children. So we will see kids who observe maybe three, four, five sessions before they really start engaging. But I will say we often hear from parents, my kid came home today and they were teaching us all these yoga poses. And sometimes <laughs> Kim and I are like, really? Because they sat there and didn't seem to be engaged at all. But they are. And I think, again, like Kim mentioned when you were talking about calm, it's fun and engaging and it's energetic, but there's also this sense of calm that comes through the practice and the sessions that is, it provides for that co-regulation, which is so important when we're trying to help children learn and when we're asking them to do things that are difficult. I mean, these, some of our poses are difficult, but mm -hmm. As a child attempts and we give them great praise and encouragement, and then they get their version of the pose, I mean, their ownership is there and they love it and they feel so good about themselves. And that's what we need to see success in therapy is confidence. And that's something that we feel these sessions in these classes really help build in these children. And as you're taking a lot of this into different settings and you're trying to make it broader in nature so schools can adapt to it and hopefully other clinical settings start to use it, multidisciplinary care models start to incorporate it to be able to help um, children to be able to thrive in whatever environment they're in. Um, are there are there prerequisites that you'd say or is everybody just on their own journey or are there considerations to take into effect of is this right for this age group or do I have to modify? Because some of the stuff as fun and as energetic as it is, I could see a 12 year old being like, you know what, I, I think I need this tailored slightly different for me. Um, and it might just be maybe more of the yoga, less of the, the games. I, I don't know how that works, but uh, Kim, is there is there a difference in the way that you're looking at this? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I think it, you know, we've tried to follow the lead of the children um, while, you know, giving them a framework. So I remember having a class of maybe six kids who we, you know, I taught the flow to, but they, they kind of were over it and ready to be on to something else. But I really wanted the repetition, the automaticity of it and the, pr the practice of 
the flow because there's a lot of benefit to it. So I was noticing like one of the children really liked um, superheroes. So I'm like, okay. And I went into the first pose. I'm like, what's this superhero? And then he said what it was. It's, I don't know, um, the Incredible Hulk or something. And so then we just went through it and went through his eyes. And then there was another student who was kind of on the fringes and his area of interest was music and all the musical notes yeah. on, in the music room, which um, was kind of cool because there were musical instruments around pictures. And I said, oh, I see that you're looking at the, the instruments. What do you think if we put that into our flow? What would this movement be? Which instrument or which sound or, you know, so then it really engaged him in a way that I would not, I couldn't have planned for, which was so cool. So we can modify and instead, you know, if a child is more into like karate or kung fu, then we can, you know, instead of like some of our movements are like this, crossing the midline, we might be like, hiya, 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 or, you know, like um, kind of doing a hand slap across, you know, body like that. And just making a sound that might fit whatever they're, you know, if they, like I said, like if they like karate or something. So we can kind of make it some more age appropriate. And then they don't always like to have it be called yoga. <laughs> so we call it movement or, hey, let's move our bodies. So those those are my initial thoughts. Amy, I don't know if you wanted to add or Jeffrey. I, yeah, I totally agree with Kim. I mean, I think it does seem that it appeals more to the younger population, but we have adapted this to work with older kids, high school age children. I have a client who's 30 years old who I do this with, and we just, we, we make it more, um, I mean, it's still fun because yoga just is so fun, but like you said, um, instead of doing the games and songs and things like that, it's just really talking about how we're moving and what's going on with our body and describing the feelings and, you know, what's the difference between strong and weak and tense and I don't know the opposite of tense, <laughs> but relax. Yeah. yeah, relax. There we go. Relax. So, you know, those are some of the, the different things that we would work on with an older population. But even that being said, we still talk about that kind of stuff with the younger kids. So, mm -hmm. um, but it does easily translate to, to lots of different populations. Yeah, I would have, uh, just as you're building out and this picture for me, as far as what it, what it really looks like is that it sounds like there's, there's concepts of occupational therapy, speech pathology, the yoga, the physical fitness, there is mindfulness. There's, there's so many concepts in there, which each of these professionals on their own probably tailor all their sessions to, well, who's the individual? How do I get them to attach to this? And it sounds like you all have created that model to be able to incorporate everything into this multidisciplinary system that, you know, you're looking at the individual and how to help them to achieve and empower them through the process, which I admire. Um, is, is there a story? So, um, I, and I'm, I'm trying to recollect right now, but I, if I'm correct, there is a, uh, on your website, one of your, one of the clients that uh, was on there was a, a young lady by the name of Ava, and she was working on sounds. And uh, the, I think it must have been the uh, F sound versus the TH sound. But I was watching it and I'm thinking, okay, for her to get to where she was on that video, there must have been a path through this because you were referencing what did, uh, well, let's not do the, let's not do the pose on that yet. Let's, let's wait, let's, or you're prompting her with it, but she was trying to make it almost more normalized and almost self cue through the process. Can you tell me how that, how that works as far as establishing a skill, generalizing the skill and empowering somebody to self cue over time? Cause that's, I think, the biggest success with the with the articulation or the communication piece is that it becomes second nature because your body feels what's happening. Um, I don't know who who had that story, but if if one of y'all don't mind sharing it, that'd be awesome. It was me, the articulation person, Amy. <laughs> <laughs> but Kim has a ton of really cool stories as well of of clients. Um, but yeah, so this client. This was early in our days of establishing the talk yoga concepts. And so she was one of our, can we call her, like one of my guinea pig kids who I really got to practice so many of my ideas on. She had um, apraxia of speech. 
So we were really working hard on that motor planning piece. And so I had taught her, you were right, she was working on the TH sound, she was substituting TH for F. Um, and so I had taught her the two poses, the feather pose, <laughs> the fire pose, sorry, she was saying the word feather, the fire pose and the thunder pose. And at the beginning of, I would, I would say, the beginning of her time with me, we started these poses and the video on our website is probably like two weeks later. So she's learning the poses, learning the movements and the idea of airflow. And what do I do with my teeth? My teeth are in contact with my lip. And so my hands are in contact. That's how you make the fire pose. The hands are up over your head and you're kind of swaying side to side to get that feel of the airflow. Thunder is different. You're on the floor and you're jumping your legs up to help your tongue jump out of your mouth while you're getting that airflow. So she had learned both of those poses. And I always like to make sure everyone knows we're sitting at a desk in that video, but that was rare. We were usually on the carpet learning these poses, but she had done those poses enough and had established that muscle memory that that's how I could cue her. And then like you observed in the video too, she was kind of self cueing. So it all became a little more natural and she needed the movements modified because she was sitting in a chair to first get that motor plan back, but then trying, you know, then I faded that pretty quickly and she was able to produce that word feather, which for the speech pathologist, like that's the worst card on the, on the articulation deck. It's like, why do we have feather? It's so hard for kids to say, but I, we love that video. It really just shows the benefit of that, of incorporating the gross motor movements for her. Cause she really did remember it. You can see her processing it. Oh, right. I have to do my teeth first. Then my tongue comes out. So that's the story of, of her. And I, you know, she's no longer my client and I miss her. And every time I see that, I'm like, oh, that was just pretty special because it really did. It shows so much of what this this method can do. And not only do you see her success and and I mean, even even not watching the beginning, you can see that there must have been steps to it, to the progress. Yep. The most exciting thing for me was seeing her joy. She was so proud of herself. Yes. in the process and you could see is that this was not a this wasn't a forced learning experience this was a one that she totally absorbed and was so engaged in. and it's just so fun to watch that one of the um one of the components is that i mean you all do your your practice but you also empower so many others with consultative services and with trainings and i'd love to hear because i uh, the scalability of doing something like this is so important, but it relies on other clinicians being able to support the model like this. So when you are consulting or training others, how do you work within those other disciplines? And maybe I'll do it within the behavioral world because I, I know that world pretty well. How do you help them to understand this could be easily moved into a treatment plan or into a classroom or into something else where you are going to be able to help prompt this child to be so successful just by creating a new environment, creating a new way of experiencing new sounds. How do you get the buy-in? And Kim, maybe maybe you can give a little bit of understanding to this because you have that background in the education system as well, <laughs> granted hmm. at a higher level, but. For sure. No, well, I, I have the honor of working with um, um, across disciplines with o occupational therapists, physical therapists, and speech pathologists all in an outpatient um, pediatric setting called MoCo Movement Center. And it's been really cool to collaborate with my colleagues there. So this is one specific place that we collaborate directly with the, with the clinicians. So for example, um, we have a few physical therapists who, if I have a client and I'm working on specific speech sounds, yoga movements, talk yoga movements, and I see that they're, they could use some strengthening in their core. So then I let them know. And I say, this is what I'm working on. How can you implement this into your session? And then they'll say, oh, I see. Okay, well, then I'm going to try that and I'm going to add 
sometimes what they do is they add the steps that the student needs to get to before they can have the, you know, more full postural support, um, for example. And it's really cool to see how we can you know, bring that together and that they'll then try to implement the sound productions into their therapy. And then we, we work you know, across disciplines that way. And then occupational therapists, I think, get it in a very different way for the sensory piece, you know, the sensory regulation. And so I don't think it, it really takes a lot of convincing on either side, you know, for the OTs or the PTs, because once we kind of show them, they uh oh, they see the application for their own discipline. And so the, you know, the OTs definitely get sensory integration and they understand why you know, we're flowing or why in our tune-ins we're rolling back and forth. And then we, you know, all the fast, quick movements we do, and then we're, we sit up and we're ready to learn. They understand that that's an in to getting into their OT session. If the child comes into the OC, OT sec, session really like dysregulated, the yoga or parts of, you know, the top yoga program can just be broken apart and implemented and so that's the thing we really try to teach our colleagues is, you know, we use the talk yoga lens, but we when we first assess the student when they first come to us and we, we think about, are they are they tired? Oh, then we need to do movements that will wake wake them up. Or if they are really, you know, um, sad, what can we do or or wiggly? And then, you know, the other thing that I think is really important about the talk yoga is putting it back into the hands of the child. Like you look wiggly. We used blah, blah, blah movements before. Do you think that might help you today? Or what do you need? What do you think you need? Do you want to breathe or do you want to move is what I ask them. I give them two choices. I hope they're going to pick one of them. Oh, I might, I need to breathe. Okay. Well, let's, let's breathe. Do you have, do you want me to choose a breathing um, practice or do you want to choose? And then I let them choose. So it just all comes together when we work with the OT and PT and speech. It, it's, it's funny to me that it's taken 30, 40 years of all these practices working in silos for us. I still <laughs> finally all realize, you know, the holistic approach probably is most beneficial. You take everybody's knowledge set and blend it together, you're probably going to get a better product. <laughs> um, but it's also the, the chance, like you said, is to be able to, across all these disciplines, is to be able to get the the practice effect, the muscle memory, the, the the similar sort of cueing, so that somebody always feels empowered with every tool they have in their belt, not just empowered for thirty minutes while I'm here, but this this yeah. tool follows me everywhere, and everybody has a chance to benefit from it. Um, so there's there's so much to that. Um, one of the things that your treatment um, and I and I whether it's the speech component or the yoga component, is that it seems like it crosses over diagnostic categories completely. And quite frankly, it, it sounds like it would actually benefit a lot of people who maybe don't even have any sort of diagnostic condition. Um, if I were to work on my articulation skills, there's probably a lot that I need to figure out to be able to understand what that feels like, how to be able to produce the sound better, anything like that, that I haven't worked on that I would imagine this would just lend itself to where where do you see the field going? Um, you all are pioneers kind of for this, but I mean, where's the where does it need to start moving a little bit more? What are the populations that we need to reach out to better? Well, that, that's such a good question. I mean, Kim and I often say the possibilities are endless, like talk yoga can help so, so many people. We would absolutely love to have talk yoga programs in preschools everywhere. <laughs> I think that expanding it into get, getting into the early intervention world, not just to address speech and language, but to start at an early age to teach children how to pay attention to what they're feeling inside, to their emotions, to how their body feels, to the nervous system. So, you know, I think we would love it. We would love it to be in all preschools, to have an element of this in, in the school systems would be so beneficial. Um, Kim and I talk a lot about bringing this to the elderly population, to those who um, we were talking a little earlier about stroke patients, patients with Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinson's, 
Um, we know, especially with Parkinson's, movement is so important in that population as is speech and speaking, you know, speaking loudly, keeping things strong and big. And yoga would be a really great method to address a lot of the things that Parkinson's patients um, need to work on. So I don't know, Kim, what are your other thoughts? Yeah, I think those are the, you know, the main ones, but also I, I always think about parents, like that's a whole nother constituency that we, you and I talk about a lot. And you, you said when sometimes the kids are not necessarily participating or they are, but they bring it home. And that's really most, you know, improvements, all improvements happen in between therapy, right? Therapy sessions. So we can only do so much, you know, and 30 minutes, an hour a week or whatever the case may be. But um, I think really helping parents to bring this into the home as a strategy and just have everyone learn to like check in with each other. Before I was before yoga, I was feeling blah. Now I'm feeling happy. So just a simple thing like that, in addition to all the other benefits that they could be having, you know, practicing articulation, but just again, like that connection. So I think I see parents as a really big group who we want to work with. Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more with with that sentiment. I honestly is that having a therapeutic experience that's also a shared experience, which is also a fun experience for a family to engage in. I, it, it's the best of all worlds. Like there's nothing that that seems to break down in that process as long as you are looking at how to be able to incorporate it and make sure everybody feels valued through that treatment. Um, and every one of those other options, as far as being able to build a network and be able to kind of expand this service across age groups and everything, I think is, it will be so valuable. But right now we're, we're kind of where we're at and that's the, the younger population. And that's, that's who we've been able to work quite a bit with. Um, where can families, where can schools, where can clinicians turn to for those resources, the books, uh, your trainings, um, Where's the information to be able to get there so they can start the process of trying to incorporate your treatment into what they're currently doing? Well, so I would recommend they check out our website for sure, which is um, talkyogaslp.com. We have some valuable resources there, but I am just going to plug our Talk Yoga Articulation Cards <laughs> on our website. And these, these are uh, would be a great place to start for parents, any therapists, preschool teachers, yoga teachers who teach children and want to bring an element of speech and language enrichment into their classes. So these cards have all of the poses that we created and modified from some already existing yoga poses, because we always want to give the ancient practice of yoga, all of the credit, because that's why we're here today. So we've modified those poses. We've added some of our own, um, but there's really clear directions, modifications on the cards. Anyone could pick these up and could use them. And, and they're fun for all ages too. I mean, again, yes, it might be the funny, silly part can be more interesting for the little kids, but you can also make it very serious for older older kids as well. So I would I would say check that out to get a taste of what we offer. And on our website, there's information about our trainings. Kim, do you want to share a little bit so I'm not talking the whole time? Oh no, it's not, it's fine. I mean, we do have resources on our website, but some of the books we kind of pulled to you know share with you guys today. There's a book called Yoga Therapy for Every Special Child by Nancy Williams, mm -hmm. and then um, I'm kind of addicted to polyvagal theor theory. So this is the polyvagal theory in therapy by Deb Dana and forward by Steve Porges, of course. Um, there's just lots of great insights in there. And then this is a really nice book. It's kind of like almost textbook like it's called Yoga Therapy for Children with Autism and Special Needs by Lois Goldberg. And we found these to be really helpful in our work, but we, you know, we use a lot of different resources and put together lots of different styles of yoga that we see benefits of. So 
I, I don't know. I mean, just, I think the biggest thing I would say, this is what's coming to me, just get on the mat and try yoga and see how you feel and you will be sold on, <laughs> that's the, I think the biggest resource is ourselves mm -hmm. and we should, you know, look within, the answers are there and practicing yoga and breathing really are grounding and centering. And I, I do yeah. think there are a lot there are a lot of therapists out there that are really loving the practice of yoga and are wanting to find a way to bring it into their therapy. A lot of the therapists that we train will say that to us like, oh, I've been trying to figure out how to do this and thank you for doing this. So um, yes, you can definitely check out our website for upcoming trainings. We have one coming up in November and then another in January. So there's an opportunity to meet us and it's going to be live, but virtual as well. And we, we have an online training also that is, that is available. It's being updated, but it will be available soon on the website. So. I've heard that desire echoed in our centers. And I know that we actually have some of our uh, clinicians that are doing yoga but I would imagine as being a little bit more intentional and actually experiencing the training would be so valuable. I appreciate both of you all coming on, Amy and Kim, and sharing your passion, your experience and expertise and, and getting people talking about the, the service. So I think that this is probably the first step to get everybody to start thinking about how can I incorporate talk yoga into what I'm doing? So thank you for, for sharing your time with me today. Thank you. Oh, thank you.